please show us Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Turning your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Looking at verse 13 specifically, but we'll start with verse 12 for the sake of context. Colossians 3, 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. The name of this message is You Must Forgive. This passage is difficult, not because it's hard to understand. It's actually very clear. The difficulty is in obeying it. This is weighty because of the implications that are found here. Only the forgiven know how to forgive. Only the forgiven are able to forgive. Only the forgiven will forgive. Are you a forgiven one? If so, how do you know? Have you been forgiven of all of your sins? How do you know? The most important clue to knowing whether or not you are forgiven is found right here in this verse. You forgive others just as God has forgiven you. I want you to think about the people in your life that you need to forgive. The strange thing about it is there's never a time in our life when we don't need to forgive someone. I want you to think about those people, that person. Who are they? What do they do to you? Maybe they're still doing it. Maybe they've died, but you still have not forgiven them. The cure to your forgiveness, dealing with your unforgiveness, is found right here. Bearing with one another And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. We started with verse 12 because it's important that we recapture the the flow of this. Because the Lord chose you for himself, himself instead of giving you what you deserve, because the Lord set you apart bore himself to be a billboard of his mercy and his grace and his kindness, respond. Because the Lord genuinely loves you with an infinite, eternal, and divine love, you're supposed to respond with a compassionate heart because he has been compassionate to you. You're supposed to respond to his kindness by being kind to others. His meekness and his humility is supposed to produce in you meekness and humility toward the most annoying, the most frustrating, the most difficult people in your life. Because of his ongoing current patience with you at this very moment, you are supposed to be patient with the very people in your life who test your patience the most. This is the proper response for everyone who has been chosen, set apart, 
and loved. This is a command to put on the new man, which in other words is a command to put on Jesus Christ himself because he is the ultimate example. He is the very personification of compassion and kindness and meekness and humility and patience. But Paul doesn't stop there. Because all of these things are attitudes. How are these attitudes demonstrated? He tells us, bear with one another. What does it mean to bear with? It means to endure. It literally means to put up with. Right in the middle of this room, there's a pillar. That pillar is meant to bear the weight of everything on top of it. In ancient Greece, they built with a lot of pillars. Likewise, all of the weight was upon the pillar. Paul is commanding the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God is commanding every Christian to be a pillar that bears the weight of difficult people, difficult circumstances, difficult situations. Bear with them. That's hard. The opposite is giving up on them, dropping them. Rather than giving up on them, put up with them, endure them, tolerate them. The word is also used in the present tense. Now, children, you all are back in school. If something is done yesterday, that is past tense, right? If something is supposed to be done tomorrow, that is what tense? future tense. If it's done today, that is the present tense. This word bearing with is in the present tense, which means you are always continually without stop, without intermission, no break, no day off, no holiday, no weekend. You're always supposed to be commanded to be bearing with one another. Remember verse 11? Here, there it is not Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave-free, but Christ is all and in all. You remember the differences in that community? Imagine the Greek looking at the Jew with all of his, or rather the Jew looking at the Greek with all of his Gentile ways. The tendency and the temptation to just say, that is unlike me. That's different. I don't like that. I don't want to be around this person. Here comes the command, bear with him. Here's the barbarian looking at the Scythian as he eats and doesn't use a napkin but wipes his mouth with his sleeve and he says, oh, this is so barbaric. This is so disgusting. And rather than going to another table, endure. Bear with the differences. Bear with the disagreements. And among us, if we spend enough time together, we're going to discover the same thing is true. There are differences among us. There are things that would cause us to grow annoyed with each other, to complain about each other. And rather than doing that, we are to bear with one another. That doesn't sound like the most loving language. Put up with them. But it is. In fact, Jesus himself used this very language. You remember, there he was, here was this child who had a possession of demons within him, and the man brought the, uh, the disciples to the child, asking that the child would be released from these demons, but the disciples didn't have the ability. Matthew 17, and when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to, into your disciples and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation. And here it is. How long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. Think of the Son of God, perfect. And on earth, who is he surrounded with? Nothing but twisted, perverse, the King James says. 
unbelieving, faithless, wicked, sinful people. He's surrounded by nothing but difficult people, and yet he endures. How long? What was the answer to that question? How long must I bear with you? Well, if you're a Christian, the Lord Jesus is bearing with you right now, isn't he? From Cana to Calvary, from the empty tomb to the right hand of the Father, Jesus Christ is bearing with you right now at this very moment. The faithful Christ is bearing with you in all of your unfaithfulness. The pure Jesus is bearing with you in spite of all your impurity at this very moment as you draw breath and exhale it. Therefore, you must bear with one another. Any of you grateful that the Lord bears with you, that he doesn't dismiss you, get tired of you, send you away, but he bears with you? I mean, we're grateful for that, right? That he is still kind and still patient and still compassionate. Then you're to do that same thing to one another. Who in your life is on your mind right now who is difficult to bear with? Who is it that annoys you? They just keep messing up. How many times have you messed up this morning and yet the Lord bears with you? They keep forgetting things. How many scriptures, truths, promises have you forgotten and the Lord bears with you? You have to keep telling them things over and over and over again. How many times has the Lord told you over and over and over again? Do you struggle to bear with the failings of the weak? On Facebook right now, again, I was talking about the election, Twitter, social media. It's sad to see what's happening. Professing Christians at war with each other. And listen, I, I get it. I don't want to minimize these things at all. The issues are important. Babies are being murdered. Godlessness is being endorsed. The Democratic Party is a, their, their very platform is anti Christ and for a Christian to support such a party is confusing to me but with that being said let me say this I have seen such venom and ugliness being tossed back and forth by fellow Christians because of these differences and it is ungodly there is no bearing with one another there are attacks there are assaults there are insults, and it is unchristlike. Hatred being spewed. So much of that is against what we see here. We're just so quick to give up on people. But Christ bears with us. Therefore, we must bear with one another. I mean, really think about it. Think about your own life and the Lord's bearing with you. How many steps forward and steps back have you taken in your Christian life? And yet, He's promised never to leave you, never to forsake you. Christian, hear me. On your worst day, Jesus bears with you with love, patience, and a compassionate heart on your worst day. Will you then dare say to another child of God that you're done putting up with them? This person, your wife, your husband, your sibling, whoever, a member of the church, someone outside, this Christian who's been bought with the same blood as you, God declares them righteous just like you. The Spirit of God indwells them just like you. You've been saved by the same faith, the same grace. You call God your Father just like they do. And would you then dare turn to someone who's received the same grace as you and say, I'm done? I give up?
May it never be. So bear with one another. Bear with the quirks and the annoyances. Bear with the cultural differences. Bear with the secondary and tertiary theological differences. Bear with the strengths and weaknesses that are different. Last week at the fellowship, I was going around to the men and I was asking them, you know, in the the, the different characteristics that Paul laid out, compassion and heart, kindness, meekness, humility, patience, which one of those has the Lord really helped you in and which one do you feel like you're so far away from? And you know what I found? One man would say, I really feel like the Lord has helped me with patience. And then the man in the same circle would say, I struggle with patience the most. And I rejoiced. You know why? Because it shows that God is working in us differently. One strength in one person may be a weakness in another. And we can bear with one another as God grows you and you become strong. And I'm still struggling with that. We bear with one another as we're all growing together. Everybody's not at the same place. We bear with one another. But if you look at your brother and despise them, if you look at your sister and despise them because they haven't mastered what God has given you grace to master, then what is that? Don't do that to one another. As Ephesians 4, 1 says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Well, Paul continues bearing with one another, but then he says this, if one has a complaint against another. When it comes to bearing with one another, we may be dealing with preferences, opinions, differences, you know, little things that may not be uh, really anything that is actually sin. It's just a matter of personality. It's a matter of preference, a matter of opinion. But here he uses the word complaint. He takes it to a more serious level. This is actually a complaint, which means a quarrel, a reason to blame, an offense. This is something that you can point to book, chapter, and verse and say, you have sinned against me. You have wronged me. You have violated me. You have done wrong. And this is what God has to say about it. It is a complaint. It is valid. It's not imaginary. It's not someone overreacting. It's genuine. It's real. It's a complaint. What then? Now what? Do you have a complaint against someone here today? Did you argue on the way here? Isn't it amazing how Sunday morning can be the place for so many complaints to arise? What did they do to you? What did they say? Maybe it was something they left undone. Maybe it was neglect. Maybe it was disrespect. Or maybe it could be something much, much worse, much, much darker. It could be a father who abandoned you. It could be a brother or an uncle who molested you. It may be a friend who betrayed you, a spouse who wronged you in deep and painful ways. You know who has harmed you. You know who has hurt you. In fact, you may be thinking about them right now and the very fact that we're talking about forgiveness makes you uncomfortable because you don't want to deal and think about the fact that you might have to forgive that person because they've wronged you so deeply and so severely. And here's the thing that makes it even more uncomfortable is Paul is writing to the saints at Colossae. What's the implication of that? Christians, you will have complaints against other Christians, and Christians will have complaints against you, which means it is actually possible for a Christian to sin against you. I know that's a news flash. <laughs> I know that's news to you, but the fact of the matter is, that raises the stakes. It's one thing if we're talking about the world, the lost wronging you. It's another thing when we're talking about a Christian. 
Because we should know better. I should know better. And yet there are valid complaints that can be brought against me and you. Real quarrels will arise. Real heartbreaking faults will be found. Painful and shameful behavior will be conducted even by saints of the living God. So how do you deal with it when a complaint is there? The world has a way. The world has grudges, feuds, vendettas. Throughout history, there are famous uh, grudges that have been kept. The, the word vendetta means a prolonged bitter quarrel with or a campaign against someone. In every country, every uh, generation, you can find examples. My problem was I had to try to whittle down the example because there were too many. You take something like the Bloods and the Crips. We're familiar with them. Why are they enemies? Does anybody know? One wears blue, one wears red. Is it just a matter of color? Do you know that it goes back to high school fights in the 70s? Un countable numbers of people have been murdered because of this ongoing feud. But the most famous example, at least in our country, would be the Hatfields and the McCoys. Anybody heard that na those names before? If not, let me tell you about these people. They were the Hatfields, they were a wealthy family, and then the McCoys, which was a more working class family, and this started during the Civil War. The Hatfields were pro-Confederate. The McCoys supported the Union. And they had these differences. And they had skirmishes here and there, but things really came to a head when there was a feud, a dispute. This is not imaginary. About the ownership of a pig. A pig. It ended with the McCoys killing one of the Hatfields, and from there the conflict escalated into an all-out war with both sides regularly perpetrating killings, beatings, and kidnappings against each other. The feud reached its bloody peak in 1888, and what was known as the New Year's Night Massacre, a group of Hatfields attacked the McCoy cabin in the middle of the night, killing two children and beatily, be brutally beating their mother. The men burned down the house. This caused the state to get involved. This feud went on for decades, and even to this day, there are still descendants who do not like one another. That's how the world deals with complaints. They say time heals all wounds. Well, no, it doesn't. All it did is just festered and grew and became more and more intense. So how do you deal with the complaints against someone else? What do you do when someone wrongs you, when someone offends you? You know, they name Alexander Hamilton. He's on our $10 bill. Allegedly, he kept a 15-year record of every offense, every wrong, and every disagreement that Aaron Burr made against him. Aaron Burr is the man who eventually killed him in the famous duel. Are you like Mr. Hamilton, keeping records, detailed accounts of all the wrongs, all the offenses, who did what, who said what, when, where, what they wore, what the place was? 1 Corinthians 13 says love keeps no record of wrongs, and yet somehow some Christians seem to think that they're exempt from such a thing. And not only are these records kept, but the complaints are pulled out, thrown into the faces of the offender as soon as things go wrong. So what do you do when you have a complaint? Here's what the Bible says. Forgiving each other. What do you do when you have a complaint? You forgive. Simple, straightforward. 
but the Lord knows us. My son Adonai says, adults make simple things so complicated. He's right. You know, the fact is, we look at the words forgive, and we would turn that and twist that and put all kinds of exception clauses in it. I forgive you, but I'll never forget what you did. I forgive you, but you better not mess up again. I forgive you, but I'm watching you. But the word of God gives us clarity. What is the standard of forgiveness that the Christian is to display? Forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. If he only said bear with one another, and if someone has a complaint, forgive the other person, we might be able to deal with that and say, yeah, I have a definition of forgive that allows me to still hold on to some of my anger and, and offense and record of wrong, but I forgive you in my own way. But he removes all of that by giving us these very enormous two letters, as. As. Our natural response when someone hurts us is not to forgive them. What's the instinct? To hit back harder. Some of you grew up like I did with a lesson. If someone hits you, you hit them back so hard that they never want to hit you again. But the Lord doesn't give us this option. He tells us to forgive just as God forgave you. You think of those two letters. They make all the world of difference. And, and the Bible uses those two letters in different places. Think of Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's an amazing promise. The same power that raised Christ from the dead, the Holy Spirit, that same spirit, the same power that raised Jesus dwells within your mortal frames to give you the power to live in victory and holiness. You do not have to be a slave to sin because the power of God dwells within you as what about Romans 15, 7? Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. I mean, that always raises the stakes. When you put Christ as the standard, I need to welcome you. Not welcome you as a stranger, not welcome you as a friend. I need to welcome you as Christ welcomes. And then you start to dwell upon that. How does Christ welcome me? What about this? Ephesians 5. One, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. What is the standard that you and I are to love one another just as Christ loved us? Well, how about this one, Matthew 5, 48? You, therefore, must be perfect what? As your heavenly father is perfect. We're not to compare one another by one another and say, well, I'm better than you, so I'm kind of perfect compared to you. No, as God is perfect, that's the standard. Well, it doesn't lose any power when we come to forgiveness, does it? Ephesians 4.31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. This is the standard, not my standard, not yours, not your cultures, not your families, not your environment. Christ is the standard of love. Christ is the standard of perfection. Christ is the standard of forgiveness. The same kind of forgiveness that God has given to you is what you must give to me and I must give to you. So that brings up a valid question. How does God forgive? So I want to explore. How does God forgive? What does his forgiveness look like? What, is it, what does it feel like? What is it like? 
First, God's forgiveness is complete. All of your sins. It's like uh, Colossians 2.13. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us how many? All our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. How many of your sins has God forgiven you of, Christian? Every single one that you have ever committed. All of them. Psalm 103, 2, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives what? All your iniquity. Who heals all your diseases. All your iniquity. All your sins. I mean, that's why we sing and rejoice, right? Exodus 34, here's the Lord proclaiming his name. Remember, Moses wanted to, to see the glory. You can't see my face, but I'll make my, my hind parts, I'll make my receding glory pass by, and you will see. And what was proclaimed? Exodus 34, 6, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. All of your rebellion, all of your disobedience, all of your thoughts, all of your words, all of your actions, even your intentions. Did you know that there were laws for accidental sins? There had to be sacrifices for even sins that were committed by mistake, that weren't intentional, and yet there still required blood for them. Your intentions, your thoughts, your words, your deeds, all of it forgiven. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, what is the next part? Not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross. I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. We rejoice that not part, but the whole. Brothers and sisters, you know what? We don't even remember all of the sins that we have committed. You couldn't number them if you tried, but God knows all of them and has forgiven you of all of them. And you know what? You didn't have to say sorry for every single one. You didn't have to go into detail about what you did and how you promised and never did it again. The fact is, without even remembering every wrong you've committed against him, he has forgiven you. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless lamb of God was he. Full atonement, can it be? Hallelujah, what a savior. And let me ask you, have you forgiven everyone of every single sin that they have ever committed against you? Can someone say of you, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is forgiven with this person? Or are you holding on to any of them? How can it be that we would praise the Lord for forgiving us of every sin, but refuse to forgive someone else for their sin against us. And if you're holding on to even one, then you are disobedient to the Lord's command here. Brothers and sisters, search your heart as I search mine. Is there even one that you're keeping for yourself? Is there one offense that you pet and cuddle and nurture and say, well, no, this one, I'll forgive all the rest, but not this one. This one stays. That's not how God has forgiven you. Secondly, not only are we forgiven completely all of our sin, but we're forgiven eternally. It's not temporal. It's never brought up again. 
It's not until God gets upset at you for doing something wrong that he brings it up again. It's not forgiveness until you do that sin again. What does the scripture say? Hebrews 8, 12. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins. What? No more. I mean, this is what causes us to praise God, doesn't it? No more. Think about David. David, we know what he did. Committed adultery, lied, committed murder to cover it up. 2 Samuel 12, 13, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. He was forgiven. But how? Have you ever read 1 Kings 14, 7? It's shocking. Listen to this. Go tell Jeroboam, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because I exalted you from among the people and made you leader over my people, Israel, and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. And yet, listen to this, you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments and followed me with all his heart, doing only that which was right in my eyes. Only that which was right in my eyes? What about Bathsheba? What about Uriah? What about the census? What about eating the showbread? What about his wives? What about his children? What about all the wrongs he did in his life? Lord, what about those sins? I will remember their sin no more. That's an amazing level of forgiveness where God could say of David, because of the way in which he forgives, he only did what was right in my eyes. I love how C.S. Lewis illustrated this in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. If you're familiar, you know Edmund was the brother who rebelled. He was the brother who caused all the problems. And now here is Edmund with Aslan. And I quote, As soon as they had breakfast, they all went out, and there they saw Aslan and Edmund walking together in the dewy grass apart from the rest of the court. There was no need to tell you, and no one ever heard what Aslan was saying but it was a conversation which Edmund never forgot. As the others drew near, Aslan turned to meet them, bringing Edmund with him. Here is your brother, he said, and there is no need to talk to him about what is past. Edmund shook hands with each of the others and said to each of them in turn, I'm sorry, and everyone said, that's all right. Edmund had betrayed his siblings, he had brought down the wrath of the witch upon Aslan and sold Narnia out for some candy. And Aslan forgives him and says, don't bring it up again. And we know that Aslan is meant to be a type of Christ. This is our Lord's level of forgiveness. He forgives you, not temporarily, eternally, so much so that it's not brought up again. And the question that comes to me and to you, is this how you forgive? Or is it only temporary? As long as they don't do it again, I won't bring it up. But as soon as they do, everything comes back up. All the wrongs come back out. But that's not how he forgives you, is it? The final reality that I want to point out regarding how he forgives, God's forgiveness. Remember, forgive as God has forgiven you. How does God forgive? Completely, all your sin, eternally. It's gone. He doesn't bring it up again. But he also forgives, really. He treats you as though you never committed it. The final reality about the way that God forgives is it's not theoretical. It's not just pretty language without any reality. To put it bluntly, Jesus doesn't offer you or me a fake forgiveness. It's real and it is deeper than the surface. And I'm going to be straight with you. As I've been looking at the way God forgives, my heart has been broken because I have not forgiven my wife in that way. I have not forgiven people who have wronged me in that way. And it's shameful. But here it is, the way God forgives 
He treats them as though they never did those things. Every Christian here, you've been loved by God. How can God love you when you have done so many things against Him? How is that possible? How can He treat you with a genuine love, a genuine affection, a genuine delight when you have wronged Him so many times? How can He treat you as though you've never done these things? Because He forgives to such an extent that it's as if you never committed the crime at all. Micah seven eighteen. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of of the sea. See, your sin deserves anger, but instead there is steadfast love. Rather than him treading you under feet, what does it say? He will tread your iniquities underfoot. And what does he do? He casts the sea, the, the sin rather, into the depths of the sea. I've been on a cruise ship with Michelle and if I drop my wallet in the ocean, any chance I'm going to find that again? If you're flying over the ocean on a helicopter and ladies, you bend over and an earring falls right. I mean, is there any hope or possibility that you're going to find that earring again? You understand the illustration. There is no possibility of such a thing happening. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. But the question is how? How can a holy and just God pass over sin, forgive sin, treat you as though you didn't do what you did when you did do what you did and you did it often, repeatedly, with a smile on your face and hatred in your heart? How can he be just? See, in Islam, when I grew up, they just told me, well, on the day of judgment, if Allah is merciful, he will just forgive you. But that's not justice. What about the wrongs? When God forgave you, he didn't merely say all is forgiven, go in peace. No, we know the Bible makes it vividly clear that blood. What did Jesus say? He took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Why blood? Because Leviticus 17, 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. It was the life, it was the blood of Christ that was poured out for your forgiveness. Not only for one sin, not only for most of your sins, but for all of them. Isaiah 53, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. In fact, in Colossians in chapter 113, we looked at this before. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus Christ poured out his blood, suffering the wrath of God to pay for your forgiveness. The cost was high. And this is applied by faith, Acts 10, 43. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. You're forgiven by faith because Christ died. You're forgiven by faith because his blood was poured out. You're forgiven by faith 
because a merciful, kind, and compassionate God looked upon you in your state of sin and rebellion and pardoned you through the death of His Son. This is why He's able to treat you as though you never did the things you did, because Jesus suffered as though He did everything you've done. Psalm 103, He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. That would be unjust if it wasn't for the sacrifice of Christ, but because Jesus was punished, Jesus died and bled, now He doesn't deal with you according to your sin. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His steadfast love toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does He remove our transgressions from us. The east and the west never meet. They're always separate. And this is how God deals with you, if you are His. How does your forgiveness look? Does it resemble this? Do you say the words but still treat people as though they've committed those acts? Think of God. All that you've done, even still, this morning. And what does He say? Come close. Come closer. He doesn't say stay over there in a corner, sleep on that side of the room, yeah, you can come to my paradise, but there's a section for you. He says, no, come sit with me on my throne. Dwell with me in my Father's house. We would be one. Is this how you forgive those who have wronged you? Psalm 133 130 verse 3, it says, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Here's a question. The people who have wronged you, are they able to stand before you? Do you mark iniquities? Is there forgiveness with you? At this point, someone may begin to raise some objections. Objection one, this is unjust. If I forgive them, they'll just get away with it. If I forgive like this, they will get away with what they did. This is a sinful objection because the Lord commands you to forgive just as Christ forgave you, and it's assuming that you know better than the Lord does. Secondly, it's rooted in unbelief that God is not just, that He is not holy, and that He will not repay as He promised He will. Avenge not yourselves, beloved. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Do you believe that? But isn't it interesting that when it comes to your forgiveness, you're not concerned about justice. When you sin against God, you desire mercy, grace, and forgiveness. Have you ever noticed that there's no outrage that your sins have been covered, pardoned, and paid for, but yet when it comes to the sins that are committed against you, suddenly justice becomes the most important thing. We love mercy when it's us, but when it's others, we want justice. Why is that? Because we're idolaters. And the truth is that we love ourselves more than God at times, and unforgiveness shows this vividly. Objecting too, it's unfair, they don't deserve my forgiveness. What's wrong with this excuse? There's an assumption that forgiveness is deserved by anyone. That's a false idea that forgiveness can be earned. Is this how you were forgiven by God? Did you earn his forgiveness? Did you become worthy of it and that's why he lavished it upon you? No one deserves forgiveness. The wages of sin is death. The soul who sins shall die. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. All have turned aside. All have... All have fallen short. No one seeks for God. No one understands. 
The only thing that you and I deserve is wrath and fury. You don't deserve forgiveness and neither do I. We don't forgive because people are worthy of it. You forgive because you've been forgiven. You forgive because God commands you to. And once again, the issue of worthiness doesn't come up when we ask God for forgiveness. Objection three, I will look dumb and I'll be taken advantage of. Someone may say, but if I forgive like God, then surely I'll look foolish. Then are you saying that God looks foolish in forgiving you? But what if they keep sinning against me over and over again? There has to be a limit. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven or 77 times. But then even more than that, ask the question, what's the limit you want God to put on your forgiveness? At what point do you want him to say, that's enough? Let that be the limit you put on someone else. Luke 17, 4 says, if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Objection four, you don't know what they did. It's uncommon. There's always someone who thinks that their case is unique that the things that were done against them were more severe, more intense, more extreme than anyone else. Therefore, they think that they have an excuse to withhold forgiveness from others. And the truth is, I don't know what someone has done to you, and I would not dare to try to minimize what someone has done to you. But here is the truth. One sin against an infinite holy God is more egregious, more horrible, more wicked than a lifetime of all the wrong that have been committed against you. And if you don't believe that, then that says a lot about how you view God and how you view yourself. It boils down to this. If you're saying I can ask God for forgiveness and I believe I received it, but I will not give it to someone else. Then what you are saying is that a crime committed against you is more important, more wicked, more evil than the crimes you have committed against God. There's no other way to get around it. What you've done to God in your mind is much smaller, less evil than what that person did to you. Because in your mind, the only way you can come to this conclusion is if you are more important than God. So day after day, you can ask for forgiveness. You can ask God to have mercy. You can ask God to be patient. You can ask God to forgive, but you will not forgive the one who hurt you. Jesus could be crushed to pay for your forgiveness. He could pour out his blood, but you will not go through the emotional pain that it takes to forgive someone else. The bottom line is, if you will not forgive someone else, if you refuse, then it shows that you are not forgiven by God. That doesn't mean it's not a struggle. It doesn't mean that it's not a fight. But if you refuse, the evidence is there. You have not been forgiven. Now, it's important that I say this. Forgiveness doesn't guarantee reconciliation. You can forgive people without ever talking to them again. There are women who have been raped and they will never see their rapists again. They can forgive that man without ever being in the room with that person because forgiveness is a matter of the heart. There are people who hold a grudge against their father who abandoned them and he's dead. He's in the grave. And yet they hold unforgiveness. You can forgive that man though he does not breathe anymore. Reconciliation is the point of forgiveness. Forgiveness is meant to lead to reconciliation. But if there's not repentance, if there's not remorse, if there's not a rejection and a, uh, a fleeing away from that sin, then there cannot be reconciliation. There cannot be unity. The very reason why God forgives us is so that we can be united with him. 
That's the whole point of it. And the same thing is true. Why we forgive is the hope that there will be reconciliation. But if there is no repentance, then there cannot be reconciliation. But we have to be careful here as well. Because if you require perfect repentance from others while your own is inconsistent, then that's hypocrisy. And some people have used this as an excuse to withhold forgiveness because they say that person hasn't repented enough, therefore I won't forgive them. But their own repentance before God is, is nothing to write home about. The Lord doesn't treat you this way. In fact, what does the scripture say? God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. And what's the implication there? He's showing us kindness before repentance even begins. And it's his kindness that leads us. And he has continued to be kind as you struggle and strive to repent day after day. Well, brothers and sisters, I'm bringing this to a close. And this is the question. How do you know that you are a Christian? I mean, there's many things that we can point to, but here is an essential one. If you are not a forgiving person, if you will not, rep if you will not repent of your unforgiveness and offer the kind of forgiveness that God gives to you, then it only leads to the conclusion that you don't know it. You haven't tasted it. You haven't experienced it. Listen to the words of Jesus, Matthew 6, 14. If you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, neither will your Father forgive your sins. Mark eleven twenty five. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your sins. Luke 6, 37, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. And then Jesus tells the parable in Matthew 18. You know it. It's the parable of the unforgiving servant. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii and seizing him, he began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused. Are you refusing? He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. He can't pay an unpayable debt in prison. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. If you've been praying the Lord's prayer while holding unforgiveness, Spurgeon said you have virtually signed your own death warrant. Augustine called it a terrible petition because as you pray, forgive us as I forgive others. While refusing to forgive those who have wronged you, this prayer, which is meant to be a blessing, actually becomes a self-inflicted curse. In that case, you're really saying, oh God, since I have not forgiven my brother, please do not forgive me. 
I don't know if unforgiveness is keeping you from Christ. He told that rich young ruler, you lack one thing. And maybe this is that one thing that you lack that's keeping you from knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. But I plead with you, forgive them because you need forgiveness. And on the day of judgment, imagine it. What if this person that you refuse to forgive puts their faith in Christ? They're welcomed into eternal glory because God has forgiven them and you are cast into eternal suffering because you refuse to forgive. What a thing. But it does not need to be. As bad as you've been, God will forgive you if you will repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ today. And if you, like I, have found conviction in this message, then repent of your unforgiveness. Go to the people that you have refused to forgive, that you've given a temporary, a momentary, a surface forgiveness to, and forgive them genuinely as the Lord has forgiven you. I'd like to just share a brief, very brief, I know that the time has passed. I say these things to you as someone who needs to do these things myself. Some of you know that growing up I was sexually abused by a member of my family for over seven years. And the Lord saved me and it came to the point where I'm face to face with this individual and I don't want to forgive him because he hurt me and he even told me you deserve what I did to you. I'm glad I did it. And everything inside of me wanted to react in anger and the only escape was thinking about the mercy that I had been shown by Christ and that He had forgiven me of everything that I had done. And now, not because of any strength in myself, because you will not find strength in yourself to do this. This is the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit as you behold Christ. You will find the power to forgive. Father, thank you that you offer us complete forgiveness, eternal forgiveness, genuine forgiveness, because you poured out your full wrath on your Son. Forgive us for refusing to forgive those who have wronged us. And help us to remember Christ and all of His suffering, even as He's on the cross praying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And He even forgives when we did know what we did. Help us to remember and give the forgiveness that we've been given. In Jesus' name, amen.